Well, good morning. Uh, thanks, Margaret. Uh, you know, at City Lab, you hear a lot of great ideas about how to solve some of the major problems that are confronting this world. It could be climate change, it could be housing, equity, it could be immigration. But today, we're going to delve into another big idea about how changing the design and the function of our streets can improve the quality of life, the environmental health, and the safety for millions of people around the world. We're going to have a conversation with the renowned urbanist Jan Gell from Copenhagen, followed by a discussion with Mayor Alfred Vanderpoy about his work and the challenges that he faces in Accra. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and a preview on a very exciting new toolkit uh, that cities can use to remake their streets. And I'm going to start with something uh, close to home. How many of you recognize this place? What's the name of it? Yes. How many of you have been to New York City in the last five years? <laughs> it's a well-traveled crew. Well, so many of you have seen the transformations that we've made in the last six years with the new bike lanes, the bike share, uh, rapid bus projects, and traffic calming projects all over the city. But not too long ago, our streets looked like this. They were really designed for people behind the steering wheel. And all of the deaths, the uh, congestion and the pollution that came along with that was just seen as part of life in the big city. And this isn't just a New York City problem. Over the last century, cities have designed their streets for cars and left people pretty much on the side of the road. And designs like these continue to pose huge problems, from carbon emissions that threaten the planet to diseases like lung cancer and asthma, uh, thanks to streets like these, and communities that are literally torn apart by these kinds of streets uh, that serve as barriers rather than connections to one another. And this affects every aspect of human life, how we live, how we get around, and all too often, whether we live or die. You see this number. It means that 141 people die every hour, one person every 30 seconds. 141 people will die on our roads by the time this presentation is done. And in any other field, this would be a public health crisis. But somehow, as a civilization, we've decided to just shrug it off and say, mm, that's just the cost of doing business. And that cost is rising. Yet traffic crashes are the one cause of death on this list that we have 100% control over. And we are going to need to exercise that control soon. By 2030, 40 cities will have populations of 10 million people or more. And as our cities get bigger and denser, they're seeing the need to change the way they do business and rethink the design of their streets. And we're starting to see cities do just that all around the world. Here in Medellin, instead of building bigger roads for cars, they're laying out streets that improve the quality of life for people. It's a seismic shift, even in places like Los Angeles, which is the car capital of the United States and in Mexico City, which is transforming its roads into safe, attractive, economically vibrant places. But unfortunately, many cities are doing this kind of work despite local and national guidance, which is really traditionally focused only on traffic speeds and moving cars instead of strategies that flip that on its head and focus on prioritizing people on two feet, on two wheels, and on transit above cars. That's the idea behind the Global Street Design Guide that we are previewing today. I, I hope all of you get a copy of this. We're, we're previewing it. It will be released at the end of the year. 
uh, it really translates these transportation principles into designs that anyone can use on their streets. And this revolution in urban street design is underway in many places, but it's certainly had a big push uh, in New York under Mike Bloomberg, because as mayor, he understood that cities had to take the lead in changing the status quo. And he also understood that innovative techniques and tools transcend local and national barriers. That's why he supported the creation of this global street design guide, uh, thanks to Bloomberg Philanthropies. It provides strategies to help cities reduce speeding on their streets, improve the mobility options on their streets, uh, and make them safe for all road users. And it is the work of transportation experts from 70 cities and 40 countries. And uh, Sky Duncan and her uh, team of global experts, Sky is in the back, Sky is in the front. Um, and she's done a great job with all of these transportation leaders across the world uh, putting this uh, network together. And what it does is it highlights the possibility of what can be done on our streets. And I'm going to run through it very, very quickly. Uh, it changes how we look at our streets from the perspective of the user, from the context of the street itself, and to create street designs that actually support larger social, economic, and environmental goods. And so what it does is it looks at the street from everyone's point of view, from people on foot, as you can see on the left, to people on bikes, public transit, whether that's informal transit uh, or formal transit, people in personal vehicles, they could be scooters, they could be rickshaws, they could be cars, uh, or moving people moving goods, uh, or delivering city services, uh, and vendors, uh, people who are uh, working commercially on the street. And it really illustrates a variety of different sized streets. It could be a neighborhood main street, like many found in India. It could be a big street, a grand street, uh, like many streets that you find in South America. It could be a shared street, uh, like many streets that you see here in Europe. It also addresses how the context of a street, a single street, changes uh, along its length. Neighborhood to a two-way central street uh, to a transit mall. And a big focus of the guide is on metrics. You'll be surprised. Um, my boss uh, likes to say, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. And so we have a big focus on uh, moving beyond just counting cars to including things that matter to cities, the quality of life, health, safety, mobility, uh, economic development. And it also features case studies on how projects were done and documents the benefits, as you can see on the left. And that will vary. It could be travel time improvements, it could be amount of CO2 saved, the number of uh, uh, reduced crashes on a particular project. This is Mueve de Julio in Buenos Aires, a fantastic project. You can see the before and after. A great sidewalk project in Bangalore, a project in o Auckland, and in Cape Town. And we've worked with all of our local partners on developing these case studies. Big projects like here in Seoul, uh, which transformed a stream of traffic into an actual stream uh, in the heart of the city. And ideas to improve the space under elevated structures. Uh, I think this is really a, a first of its kind project, a swim up uh, to a subway station. I have not seen that before. Um, all kinds of projects, uh, smaller projects in Paso Robles, California, a uh, great project in Toronto along uh, the waterfront, uh, Chennai, Abu Dhabi. There are exciting opportunities in each one of your cities. And I hope that you will use this toolkit, and the brochure is uh, on your seat, uh, to help make them happen. Because when you make cities safe for walking, for biking, and for transit. You are not just changing 
the street, you are changing the world. So I hope you find that useful. Uh, if you want to join uh, the network, please contact me or Sky or any of the people in this front row here, uh, and they are, are happy to help, and we really uh, want to enlist you uh, in this new venture. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Jan Gell, who is a world-renowned uh, urbanist. Uh, he's actually sort of the rock star uh, of urban planning uh, from Copenhagen, and he has worked in cities around the world. Uh, he's written several fantastic books, uh, one called Cities for People, another transformative one uh, called Life Between Buildings. He is the godfather of people-focused urban design. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jan Gell. Thank you. Great. So today we are going to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that are in cities. And you have worked in cities literally across the globe. Big cities, medium cities, small cities, and you've kind of seen it all. And so in your work, what are some of the biggest battles that you've faced in transforming city streets? I do think that uh, the it's very much uh, a matter of changing the mindset and sort of introducing the idea that there could be other things than getting from A to B in automobiles which could matter. And uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen many cities who for years and years have had department for transportation and they counted all the cars every year, but nobody knew anything about the people who used the cities and nobody had any documentation about that. What we have pioneered in, in Copenhagen, actually from the 60s, 40 years ago, uh, is to know just as much about people and how they use the city as how the automobiles use the city. And that has been a tremendous tool for transforming the city so that Copenhagen now is a fairly nice city and <laughs> And we have got a completely new way of using the city. Uh, there are much more life in the public spaces. We have 45% of people going to work, arriving on a bicycle every day. All this has taken a gradually change of mindset. But changing the mindset is really important. And figures about all the important things are important to have because you care for what you know about. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, you know, the, so many cities are looking to places like Copenhagen to make the kinds of transformations that they want to see on their streets. But you typically get this kind of question like, well, you know, we're not the People's Republic of Copenhagen, you know? And so, you know, it's fine over there, but we really don't like this kind of vaguely Danish, you know, approach to our streets, <laughs> right? So how do you kind of translate the, the success that you've made that you've had in transforming Copenhagen and places in Europe to different settings? You know, how, do you, how, do you, how does that language work? How do you talk about it differently? Because people are very, you know, they get crazy when you talk about taking their parking space away, say, for a, a street improvement project. It's like taking your firstborn child away when you talk about some of these changes. How does, how does that go? You should know that when all this started in Copenhagen in the 60s, there were the same discussions. This can never happen in Scandinavia. This is for Italians. We are Danes. We are not <laughs> Italians. Uh, it will never work here. And they started to do it. They started to create space and peace for the pedestrians. And suddenly we started to become Italians. And we have become <laughs> more and more Italians every year because they have, they have constantly for 50 years improved the city. One of the things they have done, which is about the parking lot. I know that parking lots, parking spaces are given by God and don't touch them. <laughs> the only thing which can be done is earthquake or roadworks. That's accepted, but all the other stuff, no. But in Copenhagen, they've had a very interesting policy. We have, for many, many years, had a fantastic city engineer who would say if if you can't park, you don't drive, which is correct. 
And then he said, I take 2% of the parking out of downtown every year, and I don't tell it to nobody, so nobody will notice. <laughs> so every year, he reduced the parking opportunities and put up more tables, more chairs, more, more everything. So the city became nicer and nicer and nicer, and people wanted to go to this nice city, and then gradually they changed the habit. Instead of going in a car, they took the bicycle or they took the bus or the metro. So over a period of time, the pattern of behavior has changed. Um, so it's sort of stealth urbanism? It could be called stealth urbanism, yes. And it was also throughout was very supported by, by people because and that is what, what connects all the countries I worked in. That is, we are all same species, same homo sapiens. We've had the same biological history. Mm. We are all a walking animal. We have the same senses. We, we, if we see a nice space in China or in Indonesia or in Greenland, we can recognize it right away mm -hmm. because it fits to our body and whatever. So um, there are so many basic things about being good to people which you can use all over. And the interesting thing is so many years we've been trained to think that the purpose of city planning is to make cars happy. But in the later years we've seen many cities which have started to say, okay, let's make them somewhat happy, but make sure that the quality of life and the livability is also looked after. And generally people like it enormously. Mm -hmm and in many places where they are critical, it's because they don't know what they are missing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's so true. We did a lot of work in New York to quickly create some showcase projects that people could point to because people don't necessarily know what a plaza could really mean <coughs> for their neighborhood or even the fa what rapid bus actually could mean in New York. People thought that was an oxymoron, rapid bus. You know, that doesn't go together. Um, so we tried to do that. But one of the things that we found was that one of the most compelling ways to make the case for change was actually evidence-based. It was showing the before and after. I mean, any time uh, you're in a city, chances are if there's a new street project, I bet you a lot of pennies that a taxi driver will tell you all the reasons why this is not working. Right? It's, it's slowing down traffic, it's not working. But the before and after to show that actually travel speeds are the same or it's safer ha seems to have gone a long way. Can you tell me, do, have you seen that, that before and after that kind of metric helps in making the case for street improvements or not so much? Yeah, I think that certainly it, it helps a lot. And the, the very fact that we have now best practice we have, there are so many cities which have changed their ways. So when you come to a new city, you can say, this is what they did in Melbourne, this is what they did in New York, this is what they did in Moscow, this is what they did here and there. And aren't you a little bit backwards here in this city? Because um, all this is going to happen and people are very happy about it. And it's possible now to walk to school and it's possible for elderly women to, to bicycle all over the city in some of these cities. Um, when you can show this, mm -hmm. and you can also document it in figures, then it suddenly becomes real. I could have had that. And then you start to... Uh, and it's always easier to talk to the general people than to talk to the politicians, and sometimes also the businessmen, because the general people they generally know exactly what could be good for them, their children, and their grandmother. Mm -hmm. Have there been any uh, surprises uh, that you've had as you've traveled the world as this troubadour of urbanism, uh, making all of these great changes around the world? Anything that kind of just popped out and was not completely unexpected from uh, the work you were doing? I think that, that something which is really amazing is I've had this feeling that there is an enormous hunger for more people-oriented city planning, for a change of mindset away from getting from A to B to having places of, of good quality for people, being it in rich 
cities or in poor cities. I think it's even more important to think about the quality of life in poor cities where actually the cheapest you can do is to make sure that you can walk and bicycle. That will make... We heard yesterday of a city where 15% had access to cars and they had 90% of all the road space. And we also know the case of Bogota some years ago where they prioritized bicycling and, and walking and public transportation because that meant that the, the least privileged people could be mobile. Mm -hmm. and, and that was considered to be a, a very important thing for the economy because then the, the not-so-wealthy people could go all over the city and seek work mm -hmm. instead of selling uh, cigarette lighters on the square or something, which was completely without perspective for the economy. So, um, the cheapest you can do in a city is being kind to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the most... Uh, it's visible, it's quick, and it's for everyone, and it gives you a much better city. And talking about investments, there's no investment which is less than making infrastructure for people and for bicycles. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important point because, you know, people think about major infrastructure projects as costing billions of dollars, millions of dollars, and taking years and years to happen. Uh, that was certainly true in New York. You know, we were on our fourth groundbreaking of the Second Avenue subway, and I think people had sort of given up hope that anything could change. And so to sort of show the possibility on the street by changing it in real time with just paint and planters, uh, and, and uh, stones from excess bridge projects was a really good way uh, to make that change uh, happen. Again, showing it quickly and, and not expensively, which I think uh, we're starting to see mayors around the world uh, start to do. When we talk about expenditure, I think that if uh, we have from World Health Organization a strong recommendation, please all cities make sure your citizens can walk and bike as much as possible, that's their, their global health strategy. Mm -hmm. And we know that, uh, like we've done in Copenhagen, that, the, the, um, that they do so much for bicycling and for walking, and they have this policy, we will do everything that you can walk and bike as much as possible because it's good for the climate, it's good for your personal health, it's good for the economy because when in the old days you have a much better quality of life, and you have a much lower cost for health um, if people have been active and have walked or bicycled every day in their life, they, are, they have a much better life and it's a much better economy for the city. So it's really a win-win-win, plus the city becomes more livable, quality of life goes up. You know, it's so interesting because uh, when we were uh, backstage, we were starting to have a conversation about the impact of technology uh, on our streets. Uh, and we have, uh, with transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, you know, working in our cities uh, and sort of changing the dimension of uh, the volume of cars in our city and the advent of autonomous vehicles, which are really on the near-term horizon. And so I wonder, you know, just sort of continuing our conversation about what that might mean, you know, going forward as we look forward to cities that have worked really, really hard to improve the quality of life, uh, to invite people and cyclists and, you know, people on transit to be a much more recognizable part of the city formal infrastructure. Uh, what do you think we need to be looking out for as we uh, look to see the implementation of these new technologies on city streets around the world? I really think that the world is not really in great need of new technology uh, or new technical gimmicks or whatever it's called. It's really in the need of a change of mindset because we have new challenges in Dow. There's the climate, there's the resources, there's the running out of fossil fuel and the CO2, and there is the health situation. We heard the mayor of London and the mayor of New York yesterday discussing that obesity and lack of, of movement was one of the major killers now. So we have a set of new challenges now, and 
I think that a change of, of, of mindset, a new way of going about city planning, where you can actually address all this with a very simple people-friendly policy, mm -hmm. is maybe a better, a better sure way than having business as usual and change some technologies. Mm -hmm. But of course, technologies can help us to a better life. So it should be some kind of combination. Mm -hmm. But it's so important that we start or we increase the number of cities who think differently mm -hmm. about city quality, mm -hmm. about what city is all about. And to me, it's very important that when we think about this, we think about everyone from zero age to uh, very old and not only the middle bracket who goes to work to and from because soon half of everybody is not in that middle bracket mm -hmm. and they have other demands to cities than those commuters and whatever. So it's so important that we think about the community as a whole and mm -hmm. we think in quality rather than in quantities. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. There's, there's no question that our streets are, are, are uh, being updated by technology all the time, whether it's smart lights, whether it's um, you know better demand management techniques. So it's it's coming and it's here, and you know you see the potential of technologies like ways to really integrate and leverage the the kind of uh, infrastructure programs that we have in cities. But being very mindful about what makes cities great, and it is that people and it is that quality of life is is such a crucial component of that conversation. Uh, and I think, you know, those comments are spot on in terms of what we need to do to make sure we don't lose some of the gains that we've made in the last, you know, several years. Two? No. Let's win. <laughs> oh, let's win. I thought it was time to go. <laughs> like, I'm done. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm completely in, in agreement with you that there has been made a number of, um, of improvements and as mentioned, the one thing which had surprised me most was that in such a short time when we work with this people first concept, so many countries, so many, there's been such a hunger yes. for this subject to be raised and some information because for 50 years we've almost forgotten that there were people in the cities. Mm -hmm. and, and there's such a big hunger for information about how you could make better cities for people. And that has surprised me. Well, another thing that has surprised me has been some of the innovative work that we're also starting to see around the world in places like Africa. And so what I want to do is to invite another guest to join us uh, for this conversation. And uh, I want to invite Mayor Vanderpoy to join us on stage. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the mayor has been the mayor of Accra since 2009, uh, and Accra is uh, the capital and the largest city in Ghana. And uh, this year, the mayor was named the best mayor in Africa. So congratulations. <laughs> and I believe that part of the reason that he was named best mayor is because of his work on uh, road safety. And he is one of the 10 cities in the Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety. And so, Mayor, I thought it would be great if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges that you face in a city of your size. I think it's 2.2 million. Uh, and how does that look on the ground and, and, and the work that you're doing there? Thank you, and happy to be here this morning. The greater Accra community has over 5 million people. And it has a transient community of about one million every day. Uh, one million people coming into the city. Into the city every day. It starts about 5 a.m. and it goes throughout uh, the day. And um, the growth rate by way of population of Accra is 4.3 annually. The national growth rate is 2.1. Mm -hmm. So Accra is a city that People from Ghana love to come to, being the capital city, being the, one of the commercial centers in Ghana. And then it also provides a safe haven. It's a very peaceful community, 
So you have people coming from the West Africa region on a daily basis for various reasons, mostly commercial activities. Mm -hmm. And so there is a serious human traffic with vehicular traffic in Accra every day. Every day in the morning, if I'm in the city, by 4.30, 5 o'clock, I'm walking the streets of the CBD, the, the, um, you know, the, the business district mm -hmm. of, the, of the capital city. And you see people coming from everywhere, coming into the city. I, I meet them, I talk with them, and they have needs. They love to be in the city. And you must make it a city, a friendly people's city. And it starts with, I am there, my directors are there, we walk the streets, and you see the commercial activities almost taking over the streets of Accra. And you have traders who also want to trade, they want to make business, they want to sell from the market onto the pavement, and if you don't control it, they want to sell even on the street. Mm -hmm. They want to bid, they want to catch the first persons that they can catch and sell to, so that they don't go into the market to do business. And so you have that competition every day. And we have to be creative, we have to be innovative to bring that control into the things that happen in the city of Accra. There is the challenges around infrastructural development. You know, Accra being a very old city, um, you have to, the urban roads department have to work on the roads itself. They have to improve the infrastructure. And then we also have to manage the human traffic versus the vehicular traffic. And, and how are you doing that? Well, you know, you have to be friendly, very friendly about it. I think I was listening to my good friend here, and you have to put the human face to it. Um, because the truck truck driver, which is the commercial vehicles, mm -hmm. they have to get through the city as quickly as possible so they can catch the early bird and make money. Mm -hmm. Well, the private driver or motorist also want to get to his or her destination. Then you have the big human traffic, including school children, traders, and all walks of life. And so there is the need to show leadership that we must bring human control, which is let the pedestrian walkway be available to pedestrians. Let the motorists have access to the, to the streets. And let the traders manage themselves in a way that there is no conflict. So we started with, before we would get to the major uh, infrastructure control, we had to do minor, minor things. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes a difference when you just take a red a paint and a, black, and a brush, go to the community, to the market area, and just put a red line. I love paint. <laughs> yes. I, uh, there's not enough paint. Red line. When I, when I, paint the city you want to see. When I, I told my staff, everybody, that. the works department, I said, report at this place, 6 a.m., with brush and paint. They said, what are we going to do? I said, just bring brush and paint, <laughs> and you will see. One morning, about four months ago, we went in with paint and brush and just put a line through the whole CBD. By the next morning, it made a big difference in the city of Accra. When the Bloomberg front office first came in with the idea of the need to do things, I said, okay, let's be creative and innovative. They took pictures of before. And then when you see thereafter, just with a red line, it made a big difference. The trader said, Mayor, what are you doing? I said, watch tomorrow morning. The following day, they trooped through the city. They said, oh, we love this. Now we feel safe. The pickpockets cannot pick our customers. And there is no human crash on the streets and on the pavement. You know, the, the, the pedestrians began to talk about it. And everywhere you went, the press was following this, oh, the mayor's red line. And it made a big difference in the city of Accra. I love that story. I love that story. <laughs> that is a great, great story. You know, so simple, simple things like that. Saying that we have planted a tree here. Now let's give respect to it. Because tomorrow it will go into a big tree and it will change the environment. Mm -hmm. Simple education, things like that. Today, the police, the latest police report that we receive is that crime has reduced, gone down. Gone down in Accra, uh, people feel safe, 
and we are working hard to reduce the fatality on our roads. I think that's fantastic. You know, I think there's, you can make so much mischief with paint. You know, you can really do a lot. When I was the transportation commissioner in New York, there were some, I'll tell a quick story, there were some uh, guerrilla artists and they dressed up as, as New York City DOT workers yes. with the vests and the hat and they went to Fifth Avenue and they painted a line on the sidewalk of Fifth Avenue and it said, on one side it said visitors and the other side it said New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody followed it. <laughs> And actually, people said that was the greatest idea that, you know, I'd done as transportation commissioner, you know, it was all. So there's like a lot of ways that you yes. can play with your street and yes. you know, literally signal yes. different pieces. So, uh, Jan, I'd like to invite you to, you know, have you seen a lot of this kind of transformation, quick transformation that can, that can realize the kind of benefits that the mayor is talking about in, you know, areas that, different parts of the world? Yes, certainly. Uh, and, and it's very, very common that when an area, <coughs> is, you have a set of problems in an area, then you create a pilot project, yeah. which could be with paint very cheaply. You say, could it be this solution, or could it be this solution? Then later on, if it is a good solution, you can, as it has also happened in New York, you can start to solidif solidify it with, mm -hmm. with curbs and, and yes. others, and pavings and That's whatever. But Definitely, pilot projects and experiments uh, is a very, very good idea. Are you planning more mischief? Well, you know, my, my, my people of Accra expect that of me every day. Because, you know, when I wake up, I'm in a hurry to step onto the streets. Because the people are there. Mm. And um, I love to go in early in the morning, walk the streets, see what is happening, interact with the people. And you know, you get a lot of information. They give you ideas. I remember when we put up the red paints, the following day, the traders' leadership came to my office and they said, you know, when you did the red paint in Accra, you have forgotten to go to the other side of the city. Mm. So I said, oh, do you love it? They said, yeah, we love it. So we now move out of the CBD and now red paints is everywhere, almost everywhere in the city of Accra. And the traders then, you know what they started doing? They brought their own uh, dustbins. They brought their own brooms. And they created leaderships among themselves. They called it assistant mayors. And oh, that's Yes. Okay. <laughs> so now that has reduced the generation of refuse in Accra by 40%. Wow. Yes. While they are trading, they are sweeping. And then the city provides them small vehicles that is coming through to pick the refuse. So that pride of place is there now. Yes. That you've created. And they have taken over. You know, they have taken the leadership. Now I can walk through the streets. Everybody feels safe. Everybody is encouraged. I mean, is the, what they talk about in the morning shows. You know, have you crossed the red line? Because they know you don't <laughs> cross the mayor's red line. You know, and everybody keeps reminding themselves, don't cross the red line. Traders stay behind the red line, pedestrians have it, and it's a wonderful thing. It's changing the lifestyle in the city of Accra. And then we will get to the major stuff. But right now, we are benefiting from the simple, simple stuff, changing the mindset, as you talk about. That's right. I think there's a very imp in important point in what you're saying, that you are doing, you start with the red line in the city center, but then people out there, yes. they ask for it also. I think it's very important that as time goes by, when we can manage this economically and with the workforce, whatever, that we actually look at the whole city to be a good place yes. for people to move about and to trade and whatever. Because so frequently you see the city center getting all the attention and people are having a very bad time in the rest of yeah. the city. So uh, it's so important that the concern for quality of life is all over the city, so we need a lot of paint here. Mm. <laughs> we do. Yes. We need, Benjamin we need some sponsors notes. for a lot of paint here. Yeah, no, that's going to be a sponsor, yes. sponsor, I think, for next year's City Lab. I can see paint companies really being a big part of this. I can see the movie thing moving from the thin blue line to the thick red line. <laughs> it's like the, you know, the next chapter. 
So what are the challenges that you face in implementing these kinds of uh, strategies? I'm sure there are some people that might not like the red line or, yes, you know, yes. uh, get concerned about the relocation of space. How do we, to Jan's point, how do you continue to, to make this change in mindset happen yes. and bring designs that really invite people back to this yes. degree? I think it is obvious that as human beings, we don't like change we get comfortable with what we are used to doing. And so the first challenge is how to communicate the new idea, mm. how to communicate the benefit involved in that. And you know, in, in my side of the world, everything so easily becomes political, you understand? So you have to be very cognizant of that, and you have to know that this is the right timing, especially if it is around a time when maybe a child going to school has been knocked down by a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And when you bring it home, that you see, this is somebody's child. Tomorrow it could be your child. And if you put it around the context of humanity, it goes down very well. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at what is best, the timing, and what you want to accomplish. But more often than not, when you always center around human needs, and what is best for people. We are able to cross our challenges. Mm -hmm. Then the next stage is how do we make it sustainable? And making it sustainable means reforms. So how do we get our departments to buy in into what we are doing at the state level and give us the necessary support? Sometimes in Africa, um, you know, you have city, but you have the national police that has to work with you to police all these things. And bringing the national police into the local governance sometimes is not easy. Uh, because you have to go to the Inspector General of Police who is not there with you at the local level. And sometimes, you know, they don't understand. They are far away from you. Yeah, no, they're, they're, it's, it's tough. Sometimes, the, you know, our police forces do amazing jobs in all of our cities, but they have traditional mindsets as yes. well. I mean, I remember when we were doing some of the bike lanes and, and taking, uh, convincing the fire department that these bike lanes were not going to impede the ability of firefighters to fight fires was uh, challenging. It wasn't until we got into the, to the you know, engines themselves yes. and drove them around, yes. and, you know, which was fun. I actually liked that part of that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're going to turn one of the things, Mayor, this is a great conversation. I would love to continue this uh, going forward. But one of the things um, uh, that I wanted to close with was actually a challenge that you had, I think, when we were talking about uh, different strategies. Um, and I want to talk about what some of the different design uh, strategies from the Global Street Design Guide uh, have that are, are, are possible. So we took the liberty of doing a rendering uh, on McCullough Market area, which I know you've been working on. And the um, approach, uh, as you can see, this is where we are uh, yes. in the market. And this is an approach that really embraces the vendors. And so the, this is the existing street, which yes. you'll recognize. Yep. And so uh, the idea was to remove the cars uh, and lay down a temporary surface. Building on your red line, we're dealing with um, kind of these nice light green yes. uh, stripes here. Uh, and then the next piece is to um, add trees yes. and uh, new parking and paving. And here we have the new... Uh, market. Yes. So that sort of gives you a sense of what could happen in terms of a temporary closure moving all the way through to a permanent closure. And, and these strategies are actually highlighted in the, in the street design guide. And um, uh, another quick example uh, to give you a flavor from another place, uh, this is in Bandung. Yes. Uh, pedestrianization strategies don't always make sense. And so this is actually a key corridor between a transit station and a major street. Um, you can see this big pedestrian bridge. Um, so we're looking at taking down that bridge, uh, cleaning it up, uh, putting ad adding um, uh, a pedestrian crossing, uh, widening the sidewalks. You can see the changes there. <laughs> um, also then making space for uh, biking and transit, and it's this easy, by the way. You just mm -hmm. click, and it and it happens. 
Uh, so it's wonderful. I encourage you to do that. Um, but it really, what we wanted to show was the, the potential for the, for, you know, what's hidden in, the, in plain sight, yes. you know, on your streets is sort of before and after. And so uh, we look forward to working with everyone here, uh, mayors and uh, technical experts, uh, activists, to make this kind of change happen on your street. So uh, a big thanks to our speakers. Mayor Vanderpoy, Jan Gell, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.